Hi there, my name is Darcy, and I recently caught up with Professor Oliver Robinson to talk all things anxiety. Hope you enjoy the episode. Oliver Robinson is a professor of neuroscience and mental health at UCL. He specializes in the study of anxiety. In fact, the name of his lab is the Anxiety Lab. So when it comes to better understanding what happens to the brain when we feel anxious, Robinson is a pretty great person to speak with. But before we go into the depths of neuroscience, I wanted to know how he defines this thing we call anxiety. Our definition of anxiety, it depends a little bit on the context, but we have a working kind of operational definition of anxiety, which is the response to unpredictable, uncertain, temporarily long and unclear negative stimuli. And that's different from fear, which we operationalize as the response to a predictable, knowable, certain, temporally short um, negative stimulus. So to give you an example, say you don't like spiders, lots of people don't like spiders, and I put the spider in front of you, right? You can see it, it's knowable, it's there, right? That's a predictable threatening stimulus. That's a predictable aversive stimulus. That is fear, right? The response you show to that knowable, predictable thing is fear. However, if I was to take you to a, uh, a cave, let's say, or a dark room, and I tell you, by the way, there's a spider in there, okay? You can't see that spider, right? It's dark, but it's not like you're going to be like, oh, that's fine, because, you know, I can't see it, therefore it's not a problem, right? You're going to also show some kind of, you know, aversive response to that, that is what we define of uh, define anxiety as the response to unpredictable, uncertain threats. So that's how we operationalize it. Fear is discrete, simple, clear. Anxiety is more diffuse, un- uncertain, unclear. But they're both responses to negative things. Okay. Now, both of these are important adaptive functions, right? We all want to know if something that's going to harm us is near to us. So everyone has these emotions and and they're useful, but when it becomes pathological, and and it's not a very clear distinction to be honest, but it's when these experiences and emotions, they get in the way of your daily life. Anxiety is the most prevalent mental health condition in the UK. And while on the surface, it does look like rates are skyrocketing, especially since the pandemic, Robinson is hesitant to conclude that today's society is more anxious than previous generations. With increased awareness and mental health literacy today, it's hard to know whether more people suffer from anxiety or more people are aware that they suffer from anxiety. What he does know, however, is that when it comes to treatments for anxiety disorders, there is significant progress to be made. We are okay at treating them. So we have um, pharmacological treatments that work for, I don't know, something like a third of people. Um, We've got psychological treatments that work for, depending on who it is, getting close to 50% of people. And uh, when you put those two things together, you're probably getting to a point where maybe about up to three quarters at best of people will have some kind of treatment that will work for them. But first of all, we don't know who's what. So we don't know whether you will respond to treatment X and you will respond to treatment Y. So invariably, people will spend many years, if not decades, trying different things before they find something that works. But one of the biggest problems is that about a quarter to a third of people, we have absolutely nothing, right? There's nothing that works for them at all. Um, and, and there's not, not much along the horizon, really. A lot of the sort of drug development was done 50 years ago now. I mean, there's been some changes since then, but they're, they're more or less kind of like modifications of what previously existed. And the psychological therapies we use, I mean, there's multiple waves and new waves of psychological therapy, but the success rate is sort of more or less the same. So there's really this big gap. So I think, you know, from a pure clinical perspective, it's important to understand anxiety because we just have this huge unmet burden. Okay, you might think a third to a quarter isn't that many people, but the number of people who suffer from anxiety, that ends up being enormous numbers of of individuals. And the reality is, I mean, this is true for all mental health, our understanding of the underlying mechanisms, at any level you look at, whether it be cognitive or, you know, the sort of underlying um, neurons or pharmacology or whatever, 
our understanding is really quite like light okay unlike other areas of medicine where we might have a pretty clear causal pathway from gene to cell to you know system to body to human to symptom we're really we have bits and pieces but there's not a joined up picture so the reason i think we exist our lab the anxiety labs exist is to try to first of all join a bit of that stuff together um, and then try to use that understanding to develop and inform new treatments down the line. Robinson and his team at the Anxiety Lab are working on some research projects that could have huge impacts on those living with an anxiety condition. So I asked him to explain some of the projects they're working on at the moment. So we're studying things from different angles. We're interested in the brain and then we're interested in how the brain implements what it's doing and so therefore behaviour and cognition. So on the behaviour and cognition side of things, I'm very proud of a, of a meta-analysis that Alex Pike, trainee in my lab, who's now got her own job at York, she's a lecturer at York. This is an area of research called computational psychiatry, and this is trying to understand the computations that the brain is doing uh, when someone, for example, uh, is anxious. To cut a long story short, Alex developed this whole new uh, fancy computational approach to pool all of this data together and actually what she ended up doing was build like a, a, a robotic army, I mean, a simulated in the computer, computerized army of anxious individuals and a computerized army of healthy individuals that simulated the individuals from those original studies. And then using this army, tested a bunch of hypotheses about what happens when people are anxious. And the kind of upshot of that study is that, um, and this is looking at these are reinforcement learning models in this kind of simulated uh, study. Um, there's a specific parameter in a reinforcement learning model called aversive learning rate, right? The learning rate is how quickly you change your behavior in response to something, right? An aversive learning rate, how quickly you change your behavior in response to something bad, okay? So if I tell you a piece of bad news, and you go, yeah, whatever, I'll wait till tomorrow, wait till tomorrow, wait till tomorrow, wait till tomorrow before I change my behavior, that's quite a low learning rate. If I give you a piece of bad news, oh, by the way, there was a, a plane crash, and you say, right, I'm never flying ever again, immediately after me telling you that, you have a very high learning rate. And what we showed is that people with anxiety disorders in this kind of simulation study, the, the parameter that best explained the difference between patients with anxiety and controls was this aversive learning rate parameter. Specifically, patients showed higher aversive learning rates than controls. So someone who's anxious will implement a behavioral change just that bit faster um, than someone who's not anxious. So that's one area of our work. That's cognition, computational psychiatry, trying to understand what happens when people are anxious. And then the other thing I can just briefly mention is that we've just finished finally after about seven or eight years of data collection big pandemic in the middle nightmare uh, finished collecting a study looking at a common um, anti-anxiety uh, medication in this case uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor we've just finished a large study collecting data on about 100 healthy controls uh, and about 50 or 60 patients drug placebo before after and we're only just getting the results in, so I don't have much to share, but we will have, you know, within the next few months, some nice, exciting findings telling us what's going on in the brain when people are taking these kind of anti-anxiety uh, medications, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. In this case, it's a study of uh, two weeks. Um, and I think it's probably the largest study of its kind, like in a well-controlled, randomized control trial with functional brain imaging, with a bunch of computational psychiatry tasks like the one I was just talking about. Um, and so that's pr probably the thing I'm most excited about at the moment is what we're going to find from that. Um, and, we, and, and that ties in with the study that we have ongoing at the moment, using everything exactly the same, scanner the same, task the same, etc., but looking at psychological therapy. So in about two years' time, we'll also be able to compare uh, antidepressant medication or an anxiolytic medication uh, psychological therapy, what's happening in the brain before and after, and we'll really start to get to some of these questions about what happens in the brain when people are undergoing treatment. There's a term that's been used a few times in this interview now, computational psychiatry. I was keen to understand, well, what exactly is it? So really, computational psychiatry is applying the tools of computer science, mathematics, 
to the understanding of how the brain implements behavior. What we try to do with computational psychiatry is explain how the things that the brain takes in leads to the things that the brain does. So reinforcement learning models that I've already mentioned, that these models describe how in response to rewards, punishments, good things and bad things in the environment, people learn and then make behaviors, make actions, choices in response to those things. So generally speaking, we learn to do things again that lead to good things and we avoid doing things that lead to bad things. In essence, these algorithms describe that process. Now, what's so, I think, revolutionary about this is that now we're not just describing a symptom. These models explain how the symptom arises. So rather than just saying you're anxious, you avoid bad things, we have an explanation about how when the bad thing enters your brain, how it's processed and how it leads to that change. Now, this is important because that's probably what the brain's doing. So if we really want to understand how the brain is changing in anxiety, we need to understand that full cognitive pathway. It's pretty clear that computational psychiatry brings with it some incredible possibilities. However, when paired with modern neuroimaging, we can take it even further. You can do computational psychiatry just by showing people things and measuring their behaviour, but that doesn't tell you how that's mapped onto what's happening in the brain. So combining the sort of behavioural measures that we use in computational psychiatry with brain neuroimaging means that we'll eventually be able to map not only those processes onto the things that lead to symptoms, but also where that's coming from in the brain. If you want to develop new treatments in the long term, I think we're going to have a hard time if we don't fully understand exactly what's going on. Now, clearly, we can help people without fully understanding because we do that already. But that hard to reach 20 to 30 percent that I mentioned earlier, I don't know how we're going to get to close that gap without fully understanding the whole pathway of how the brain processes information and, and how that leads to behavioral change. Um, so that's why we're using the neuroimaging uh, as well. Um, maybe now's a time to flag something that I'm really excited about in the neuroimaging realm, which is something called naturalistic neuroimaging or, or move the fMRI, which is basically we've done some studies of this in healthy individuals, um, but I think it'd be really important to look at it in people who are anxious. This is basically showing people movies in the scanner. So rather than have people do constrained cognitive tasks, which obviously have their advantages, um, but aren't terribly good at eliciting emotions, right? We can essentially steal from Hollywood and you know movie producers who can make these very effective stimuli that make people anxious or happy or sad or whatever, and we show them these stimuli in the scanner. And I, I'm excited about this because I think for anxiety, you know, there's a whole genre of horror movies which personally I can't watch, but some people enjoy watching, that make people anxious, right? And it's highly likely that some of the changes that we that happen in the brain when you're anxious are only going to be visible when you make people anxious. As you've heard, Robinson and his team at the Anxiety Lab are bringing everything that neuroscience has to offer and applying it to the study of anxiety. In terms of what they're working towards, Robinson says it's about providing people who suffer from anxiety disorders with the right treatment for them. I'd like to be able to assign treatments to individuals more effectively, right? It's, it's a somewhat lowly aspiration, but what the treatments we currently have, can I find out in advance, is there some kind of signature, behavioral, neuroimaging, pharmacological, neuroscientific, whatever it is, that tells me that you would respond better to treatment X and you would respond better to treatment Y? Because I think that's where a lot of the anguish comes in now. I mean, put aside for the fact the waiting lists and how difficult it is to get treatment, that's obviously a big problem. That's not really my area. That would be great to be fixed. But where I think I might be able to help is at some point, find a way of assigning individuals to treatment so that, for example, you don't waste six months doing psychological therapy that doesn't work for you, makes you frustrated and angry, and or conversely, take some kind of med medication that leads you with side effects and that means that you're unable to get better as well. So if we could avoid that by saying you should try this and you should try that, that would be fantastic. More long term, if we really have a better understanding of how, you know, the underlying neurobiology interacts with the world and the social environment that we live in, um, if we have a better understanding of that full, you know, causal pathway, we might also be able to develop additional new treatments, whether they're psychological, pharmacological, whatever, that targets those extra people that we don't target at the moment.
If you're a student considering studying mental health or neuroscience or both, Robinson says that there's no better place than UCL. It's why he has been here for nearly a decade. So a real neuroimaging powerhouse. We have lots of scanners, lots of expertise, lots of people researching that. Um, the, other, the other reason is the computational psychiatry. Again, UCL is definitely, I think, the, the sort of global powerhouse in, in that area. People who are applying computational models to the understanding of the brain. It's been happening here at UCL, certainly for as long as I've been here, 10 years, even earlier, um, you know, probably more like 15, uh, 20 years ago. And, and, you know, it's now becoming very popular and it's happening all over the world, but UCL is really where it got started. And so we have this huge um, group of individuals um, who do this kind of work. And it's a real sort of melting pot of ideas, which allows us to find problems. I think that's one of the biggest advantages when you have lots of people around you, you're constantly being challenged by people saying, no, oh, this needs fixing, this needs fixing, da, 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 da. Whereas if you're the only person there, it's much harder to find these problems and therefore make your research more you know, stronger and more, more robust. So I think those two reasons um, UCL is particularly good. Um, growing now is the clinical links at UCL. And, and certainly over the last five years or so, the links with things like the Institute of Mental Health um, and links across different departments and, more cl and clinical groups. We now have strong relationships, for example, with our psychological treatment services here in Camden and Islington. Um, and so, uh, so it's really a strong place to actually do the research because we have access to the patients that suffer from, from these sorts of disorders. So I, I don't think there's really anywhere better in the world. I mean, obviously I'm biased. <laughs> if a student is interested in mental health or neuroscience or any of the above, you struggle to find a better place than UCL to do, to do that kind of work. For links relating to this episode, please check out the notes in the description. A big thank you to Professor Oliver Robinson for his time, and thanks to you for listening.